let's talk about now the final thing, quality of service. And this is, uh, I left this one for last because it's one of the most complex ones. Um, sorry, one second. Uh, yeah, I left this for last because it's one of the most complex ones. There's three uh, sub things I want to talk about here. Uh, tiers, lanes, and priorities. These are three features that we have in Druid that enable, uh, enable quality of service, give you the tools that you need to ensure consistent performance, even in a multi-tenant environment. So uh, in order to talk about these, I'm going to first talk about how Druid's query stack works, and then uh, talk about which parts of Druid query stack uh, each of these features is meant to protect and to enable quality of service for. Okay, so this is a this is a pretty um, dense slide, so let's let's go through it gradually. Um, the way to read this slide is from the bottom up, and what we're doing on the slide is we'll be this is called the layered pyramid of query performance. We'll be talking about um, what happens in which stage of the Druid query processing pipeline, and then again in, in a couple slides from now we'll talk about. Um, which uh, all those three features that we have, tiers, lanes, and priorities, uh, which of these stages they help with and how they help with these stages. Uh, but before that, let's talk, about the, the, let's talk about the stages from the bottom up. So the, the bottom most stage we have here is the data server processing threads. And there's going to be one of these threads per processor per data server. This is the most scalable. Uh, and uh, uh, generally most heavily used uh, part of the pyramid, which is why it's the base of the pyramid. Um, so this is something that scales out to all the data servers, every CPU on every data server. Um, in principle, there's nothing stopping a single query from using every single processor, every single data server. And that is actually what will happen if that query is the only query running on the cluster. Um, what's gonna happen there is we're first gonna open all the segments to match a time filter. Uh, we're going to apply um, all the non-time components of the where clause of the filter of the query. We're going to do the group buys uh, of the query. We're going to compute the aggregates that we have, like sums and averages, mins and maxes. Um, and if there is a, a push down order and limit, uh, we will do that at this point. Um, and if there's not a push down order limit, we'll do it later. So that's the bottom most layer. This layer actually reads through all the data, the actual raw data in the tables, and computes partial aggregates. Um, one level up, uh, those partial aggregates are merged together on a per data server basis. There's now one of these threads per process on the data server. Um, if the order by limit is pushed down to the data server, but not to the segment, it'll be applied here. Otherwise, if it's not pushed down this far, it'll still be further up. There's a few different layers that it could be theoretically pushed down to. Um, at any rate, once that merge is done, the data is sent to the query broker. And there's one query broker involved in every query. Um, every query broker has got a parallel uh, merge thread pool. Um, there's going to be one per processor of that query's broker. There's only one broker involved in a particular query. So this actually does not scale out to all the brokers in the cluster. It only scales out to uh, all, the th all the processors in a single broker, um, whereas the data server part does scale out to every data server in the cluster. So we're getting, we're getting less and less scale as we go to the top of this pyramid. Um, and then at the top, uh, there's actually one of these threads for the whole query, um, and that is going to receive all this data, apply having filters, do order buys that weren't pushed down, and do limits that weren't pushed down, and return data back to the client. Um, and any of these layers could be the bottleneck for a query. So some examples of bottlenecks that can happen. The bottom layer uh, can become saturated. It could be that we're processing so many rows of data for a certain query, for a certain really heavy query, that other queries can't get any CPU time. Um, the top layer can become saturated. There's only there's one of these threads per query. There's a fixed number of them in a cluster. So a typical broker would contribute maybe 40, 50 of these threads. Let's say we have 200 for the whole cluster. That means if there's more than 200 queries running at a time, then other queries can't start because they can't get a thread. Um, so at every, at every layer here, we have a uh, possibility for things to get saturated. And when things get saturated is when quality of service is important. It's when uh, quality of service is about how we decide what work we're going to do and what work we're going to put aside. OK, so I promised I would talk about priorities, uh, tiers, and lanes. Um, Two of those, uh, priorities and tiers, are really designed to protect the bottom layer. And um, query priorities, uh, what they do is they control 
uh, which query gets CPU resources first at the, at the bottom layer on the data servers. So a query with a higher priority is going to be able to preempt the query with lower priority. Uh, and the nice thing here is that um, the processing of individual data segments for individual queries is actually interleaved on the data servers. And so if you have a log running query that's low priority, uh, it can actually be interrupted, put aside temporarily for a higher priority query to run. And then the lower priority query can be resumed and the higher priority query is finished. And that's actually what will happen um, due to this ability to interleave their computations at the lowest, at the lowest level. Uh, so priorities achieves that. That's why the, a typically way that we assure quality of service is we set a higher priority for uh, interactive high-speed queries. Um, a really typical way to do that might be to set a high priority for any query that's operating over, let's say, two weeks of data or less, and then a lower priority for data that's operating over more than two weeks of data. Um, we also might set a lower priority for a download feature in our application and a higher priority for an interactive feature. Uh, this means that um, if there's a, a period of really high load, then we're going to keep the interactive features humming smoothly, and the download features will be operating a little bit slower, uh, which is OK. That's what we want to happen in a period of high load. Um, so that's priorities. There's also historical tiers. Tiers is about uh, separating out uh, different uh, uh, chunks of your data onto different groups of data servers. So rather than having everything all shuffled between all the data servers, if you set up tiers, you might say certain tables are pinned to these servers or certain time ranges are pinned to these servers. And the reason for that is to isolate these workloads. Uh, so again, using the same example of uh, um, this two week uh, time frame where we want everything to be super fast, we might take the, lap, the, the most recent two weeks of data and pin it to a uh, hot tier of data servers and then everything else on a co uh, cooler tier of data servers. Um, the idea there being that the hot tier, we're going to have process a smaller amount of data uh, and have less likelihood of being overloaded. And then the cooler tier will have process a much larger amount of data, have a potentially higher chance of being overloaded, but it wouldn't affect the hot tier. It would mean that people still get good quality of service when accessing their last two weeks of data. Um, so it's all about deciding. It's all about deciding when when the rubber hits the road, really, when uh, there is more load than a cluster can handle. What are we going to prioritize, and what are we going to um, what what do we need, what, what do we want to achieve that high quality of service for? So these these are two ways of doing that. Um, when the bottleneck is on the bottom level. Uh, Here's a little bit of a, a diagram about how that works. So um, imagine this bottom level getting blown up into each processor having its own queue. Uh, each processor uh, has a queue of segments it's going to process. Um, and let's say that the, a query comes in that hits four segments. There is some amount of work that has to be done for segments one, two, three, and four. What's going to happen is this work is going to be assigned in parallel to different processors. So maybe two of these segments get processed by processor one, and the other two get processed by processor two. So each of these processors completes these assigned items one at a time. Um, in ideal conditions, the overall time taken is just the total CPU time these are all going to need divided by the number of processors. And in terms of interleaving and priorities, the way that's going to work is if a query comes in that's a higher priority than this one, um, whatever work is currently being run will finish, but these are typically, each of these little chunks is typically quite small, typically something that takes less than a second to process. So which means the one currently running will finish and the other ones that haven't run yet uh, will stay in the queue and then everything from the higher priority query will hop the queue, uh, will get to the front of the line. Uh, so they'll start processing generally within a second. Uh, okay, so now let's talk about the higher levels, which is where lanes come in. Um, lanes is another feature in Druid that is designed to protect these, uh, what we call these Jetty threads. And we call them Jetty threads because they're web server threads, and Jetty is the name of the web server component that we use. Um, so these are, these are uh, uh, query handling threads, um, web server query handling threads. Like I said, there's one dedicated per query. And uh, the number of these threads across the whole cluster really controls how many concurrent queries uh, can be run at one time. And where you're going to have an issue is if you're running more concurrent queries, then uh, you have threads. And it's important to think about this and priorities together, because uh, priorities is not a full solution. It's something that affects this lower level. Um, 
these data server processing threads, but it's possible that you might have 200 low priority queries running and you have 200 total jetty threads. And if that's the situation, then if a high priority query comes in, it won't be able to get down to that lower level uh, in order for priorities to help it because um, there won't be any higher level jetty threads for it to take. And that's what lanes help with. Um, lanes are, uh, they're kind of like carpool lanes. Um, so if you're, on, if you're on the freeway and uh, there's a carpool lane, the way that that works is if I'm in a carpool, I can take the carpool lane or I can take uh, a regular lane, I can, I can choose. And if I am a single driver in a car by myself, then I can only take a regular lane, I cannot take the carpool lane. Um, so it's a similar uh, situation with lanes in Druid. If I'm a high priority query, I can take the, the fast lane or I can take the slow lane. Um, I can take the, the, and if I'm a low priority query, I can only take the low priority lane. So what that means is that uh, there's sort of a, a set of, uh, there's an amount of concurrent query um, capacity, so to speak, let's say of those 200 queries you can run, let's say it depends on your configuration, but let's say you're gonna reserve 20 of them for high priority queries, or maybe even more than half, maybe you reserve 150 for high priority queries. Uh, what that means is that there'll always be, um, you'll never have a situation where high priority queries are getting blocked by low priority ones. They might be blocked by other high priority ones, uh, but that's a different story. Um, if that's the case, your cluster is just too small. If you, have, if you can't run all your high priority queries, you just need a bigger cluster. Um, okay, finally, I wanna talk about scalability. Uh, so scalability is another challenge. If you have a giant multi-tenant system, you wanna know how big can it get? Uh, and with Druid, there's no hard limits. And this actually makes scalability, that makes thinking about scalability kind of tough because we don't say in the documentation, you know, you can't scale beyond this factor. Um, so I'm on this, uh, what I'm hoping to do with this part of the talk is, is talk a little bit about what those soft limits are. So there's no real hard limits, but there's areas where you might run into trouble. You might um, need to proceed with caution, so to speak. Uh, and here's a few that we've noticed in the wild. One is if you have more than a million segments. Uh, if you have more than a million data segments, then you are likely to run into memory usage issues on the coordinator and broker, um, and potentially other scalability issues as well. Uh, I think the most segments I've seen in a cluster is approaching 10 million, so you can go much higher than 1 million, but you start having to think about it uh, around a million, which is why I say a soft limit in that sense. You start having to think, you know, I need to increase my heap sizes, I need to change some tunings, you know, the defaults might not work for you anymore. Um, with this, a segment is, you know, can have a hundred, um, a hundred megabytes per gigabyte of data, which means this actually doesn't really put, uh, much of a meaningful scalability limit in terms of amount of data in the cluster. This can still be thousands of terabytes of data. Um, what you need to watch out is if you have a lot of very small segments, uh, that are, that are not optimally sized, which can happen if you have, uh, large numbers of data sources, which brings us to the next point about the number of data sources. So a thousand plus data sources is a, is a proceed with caution uh, area. And the, where the segment, the main issue with the segments is memory usage on the coordinator and broker. Um, the main issue with data sources is, is ingestion scalability. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, every concurrent ingestion requires a certain bundle of resources. And that bundle of resources is actually somewhat substantial. It's, it's about a CPU and a few gigs of memory roughly. Um, and having, uh, and also, and also all the, um, all the ingestions are mediated, uh, by a single machine that we call the overlord. And after about a thousand data sources, uh, you start to run into, uh, resource usage, uh, issues with, with all these little, um, task bundles and you start to run into scalability limits on the overlord. So for that reason, uh, we suggest keeping the number of data sources uh, to about 1,000 or less. Again, you can go higher. The most I've seen is about 20,000. Um, that's why I call it a soft limit. It's just that once you're above 1,000 or so, you're going to need to think about it more. Um, and then 1,000 plus data servers. Uh, again, here, the most I've seen is about 2,000, a little over 2,000. Um, and again, that's why I call it a soft limit. Uh, but above a thousand data servers, um, you're going to want to consider tiering out your servers, uh, splitting them into groups, uh, which actually limits the number of servers involved in a particular query and can help performance remain more consistent. Um, and again, it doesn't really put 
a uh, you can have um, many terabytes of data on a single server. So this doesn't put a super meaningful limitation on the maximum size of a cluster. It's still thousands of terabytes of data. Um, but it's just it's something to keep to be aware of.